Hello, welcome to our GI pharmacology lecture that's covering GERD, peptic ulcer disease, and peptic ulcer disease, and any acid-related diseases. So we're going to first talk about the physiology of the stomach and how it produces acid. Then we're going to talk about different drugs that target um, the acid production uh, and is used to prevent GERD and peptic Let's talk about physiology of the stomach. We probably already know that parietal cells are the ones responsible for making this, the acid. Uh, but let's talk about it from the beginning. We know that the parasympathetic nervous system is responsible for keeping our GI system active. And this parasympathetic system is uh, controlling the upper GI through the vagal nerve. Now this vagal nerve will obviously release acetylcholine, which will then bind onto M3 receptors. If you remember the um, KI, KI, like the kick kick mnemonic for the um, parasympathetic nervous system, you'll know that M3 uh, is associated with a GQ. And if you remember, GQ actually increases the calcium within the cells. There are only two main things that happen when you get calcium inside of the cells. It's either vesicles are going to move um, and, be, and excrete their contents, or there's going to be a contraction. In this case, we have vesicles that are moving. And instead of excreting, they're actually just fusing with the cell surface membrane so that these proton pumps, these hydrogen potassium proton pumps, are out in the lumen of the stomach. That way they can pump all of these hydrogens that we use and that we need for digestion. There's also an indirect route. Uh, instead of di um, directly stimulating the parietal cells, they can actually use G-reactive protein to stimulate G-cells. Please, please pay attention that I said G-reactive protein, not acetylcholine. All right, so this is actually a little variety for, with the vagal nerve. When it's uh, connected to a G cell, it'll release G reactive protein that then releases gastrin. Gastrin has an even stronger effect on parietal cells through the CCKB uh, receptor, and that causes even more um, calcium and IP3 to build up and more vesicles to uh, be moved to the lumen and more pumps to be present. But we need to find a way to activate those pumps. And there's the indirect um, effect of the G cells. Gas it'll release gastrin, and instead of going directly, to the parietal cells, it'll go to the ECL cells. These ECL cells will then release histamine. Histamine um, activates these pumps through the H2 receptor, which is coupled with a GS protein. Now, if you recall, GS protein is always associated with an increase in cyclic AMP, and cyclic AMP usually means that the body is trying to activate an enzyme or a pump. In this case, we're activating the um, hydrogen potassium pump. So now we've got a lot of pumps moved to the cell surface and we're activating them. We're making a whole lot of acid. Now how does your body hold back? How does your body control it so it doesn't get out of control? Uh, we use somatostatin as one of them or prostaglandins as a second um, inhibitor. And these are coupled, these receptors are coupled with uh, GI protein and that causes a decrease in cyclic AMP which causes a decrease in activity or an inhibition of these pumps. Finally, um, let's talk a little bit about this pump. As you can see, the pump actually pumps in one potassium into the parietal cell in exchange for one hydrogen into the lumen. This hydrogen will then fuse with, um, with chloride to give you HCl that you know uh, is used to digest the food. Uh, something that you do need to know is that uh, for how, how do we make this hydrogen? How do we keep regenerating this hydrogen? So that's really quite simple. Uh, CO2 and water actually goes into the cell or is produced by the cell through metabolism. And then we have this carbonic anhydrase inside of the cell that turns the CO2 and uh, water into a carbonic acid. And, um, and this carbonic acid can actually be broken down into hydrogen and the bicarb. The bicarb will then go in to your body and it'll give you something called an alkaline shift. You get an, a slight metabolic alkalosis after you eat a really big meal, while the hydrogen goes into your lumen and it's used to digest your food. All right, let's talk about proton pump inhibitors. They all really end in prazole. Notice that I said prazole, not just azole. There are some drugs that only end in azole or conaz like conazole, these antifungal drugs. So you need to make sure that it has PRA before the azole. And I just remember that as PR stands for proton or proton pump inhibitor. So this is actually an irreversible inhibition of the hydrogen potassium pump. What that means is that if your body wanted 
to regenerate these, it would take a couple of days to rebuild it. Luckily, these parietal cells actually have a lot of little vesicles that they have stored, so they can actually replace it within a day. But if, you, if you're taking this proton pump inhibitor for one or two days, you'll actually even inhibit all of these ones. So your body has to pretty much make brand new ones. So this is a very, very effective way to control stomach acid. And it's actually pretty much the first line for GERD, peptic ulcer disease, and even Zollinger-Ellison, depending on who you talk to. Some people do a step-up therapy where they start up. Um, they start off with PPIs, and some people do a step-down therapy where they start off with PPIs and histamine blockers. But that's that's for a clinical. That's more for clinical years. Now this is the number one selling drug, so you need to pretty much know everything about it. First thing you need to know is that it is associated with a C. difficile infection. Remember that the acid is one of the most important uh, innate immunity that our GI system has. All the bacteria that gets into our gut has to survive the acid. Well, if you're taking this, these proton pump inhibitors and you don't have as much acid, you can have a more activation of this C. difficile uh, the C. difficile into your GI system, and it can cause really bad chronic diarrhea and even pseudomembranous colitis, as you can see over here, these yellow pseudomembranes. Another thing that it can cause is pneumonia. Uh, nobody really understands why it causes pneumonia. Some people may, some people believe that without as much acid, you have a whole lot of more bacteria living in your upper GI, and that can sometimes be aspirated into your lungs, and then you can get these kinds of pneumonia. But that hasn't been really proven. Another thing that it can cause is changes in pH, which then causes a, a change in absorption by your GI, and actually it may actually have some effect in your kidney, which then uh, affects resorption um, over there. So what happens is you get low magnesium, and low magnesium, magnesium is needed to keep you calm. So if you have it low, you'll get seizures and arrhythmias, and you'll have low calcium. And if, of course, if you don't have enough calcium, you'll get osteoporosis. It can also affect the absorption of antibiotics, um, so if you get a change in pH, you can affect um, antibiotics like tetracycline, and that can cause worsening of infections, even though the patient is still taking the antibiotics. Let's talk about H2 blockers. These are pretty simple. They're actually similar to uh, histidine and histamine. So as you can see, here's histamine. Um, which is a derivative of the protein, or I'm sorry, the amino acid, uh, histidine. And cimetidine kind of looks, this part kind of looks like that, and that's why it, um, it actually binds on to the H2 receptor, and it actually blocks it right there. So it's very, very effective. It works really, really fast in preventing the excretion, or actually the excretion of acid, because it pretty much prevents the activation of these proton pumps, so they're not working at full capacity anymore. Uh, so they're actually not as effective as PPI. At one point in the 70s and 80s, they were probably more, much more prescribed, probably the number one prescribed drug, but now PPIs have beaten them with that. Now the adverse effects of cimetidine is a little bit um, strange. It actually increases the prolactin inside of your body, which doesn't really have that much of an effect in females. Maybe it might cause some lactation in females, but that's not, um, that's not, too common, that's not too significant. Now in men, 1 to 3% of men can actually develop some gynecomastia and erectile dysfunction. Here I've showed you some gynecomastia, and I've passed on showing you what erectile dysfunction looks like. Uh, so we are actually now using newer drugs um, instead of cimetidine, um, which is like rantidine, for example, that has almost no side effects. But even then, we don't even use those as often because PPIs are so much more effective. What you do need to know about cimetidine is that it interacts with other drugs by inhibiting the P450 um, system. So if you were taking warfarin, it would cause you to bleed, and if you were taking theophylline, it would cause you to have seizures. Let's talk about antacids. This is just simple uh, chemistry here. They're chemical bases um, that temporarily neutralizes the acid, so they target the hydrogens themselves. And they kind of work like, let's use carb um, calcium carbonate. You'll have calcium carbonate and, H um, and HCl. They're going to interact with each other, and you're going to have calcium chloride, which is neutral, water, which is neutral, and CO2, which is neutral slash slightly, very slightly acidic. So overall, you get a reduction in acid inside of your stomach. So again, this is only used for temporary relief, but 
what you can experience in a lot of patients is that you'll get rebound acid. Your body overcompensates for it. Something else that you probably may remember from um, your lecture on antibiotics is that it may chelate tetracyclines. If you remember, tetracyclines have an affinity to positively charged ions. Um, or po So these calciums, which are positively charged, can often chelate them and make them ineffective, and that can cause a worsening of infection. It can also cause milk alkali syndrome. For, to remember milk alkali syndrome, just remember hypercalcemia with kidney failure. So if they have a high creatinine, then you think, oh yeah, there's got kidney failure. But hypercalcemia is remembered by bones, moans, groans, and psychiatric overtones. That means weaker bones, constipation, that's your moans, groans, which is just pain, and, uh, and psychiatric overtone, which is going to be some sort of anxiety, or they, they often look like really tense, maybe depressed, just something psychiatric involved, maybe even delirium if they're old enough. So uh, let's move on to aluminum hydroxide. Now it does have a hydroxide over here, so you know it's a base. Uh, it's got low solubility because of the aluminum. Actually, aluminum, a lot of the aluminum components are actually extremely um, low solubility. So this will actually cause a whole lot of constipation. Um, something else that aluminum may do is that it can chelate the phosphate. That can cause hypophosphatemia. Phosphate is very, very important for muscle weakness. Oh, sorry, for muscle strength. So if you have low phosphatemia, you'll experience muscle weakness. And phosphate, uh, phosphate is also one of the components of bone, so you can get osteodystrophy. If you remember, hydroxyapatite is actually made of calcium and a phosphate fused together to give you hydroxyapatite. If you don't have phosphate, you can't make bones very well. Another one, you, and then moving on to magnesium hydroxide, you guys have probably heard of milk of magnesium. Um, I've got a picture over here of milk and magnesium, some al um, aluminum hydroxide, and here's Tums, which is also known as calcium carbonate. So milk and magnesium, if you've ever used it before in a store, um, you'll know that it's not only used for antacid, but it can also um, help you with constipation. It can actually give you diarrhea. So, um, so it, it has actually two effects. Something else you need to know is that if you take too much milk and magnesium, you'll have high hypermagnesemia. And remember, the magnesium causes you to be relaxed, so you'll have weak muscles and weak nerves. And remember that since your heart is pretty much all muscles and nerves, you can have cardiac arrest. Moving on to Pepto-Bismol and Sucralfate. They both have similar effect. I've got you over here, um, bismuth subsalicylate and uh, Sucralfate over here. Um, this one, also known as uh, Pepto-Bismol, and this one over here, also known as Clearfate. Uh, you can buy both of which over the counter. So let's talk about how they work. They actually work by providing a physical protection. So when they hit the acid, they start cross-linking each other, and they start coating the surface of the stomach. And once they've coated this ulcer, they can prevent worsening of the ulcer, and they can allow it time to heal. So of course, our number one use for this is peptic ulcer disease, which can be extremely painful for some, pa for some patients. But something else that you probably um, know is that Pepto-Bismol can be used to treat uh, mild diarrhea, something like traveler's diarrhea. We don't really know how it works, but we believe that it binds onto the toxins. Or maybe the cross-linking causes the wet, um, the wet uh, poop to just kind of coagulate and just come together and become more solid. The adverse effect is going to be black tongue and black stools. This is because they actually react with the sulfur, and the sulfur actually causes it to go black. Now, this is this can be really, really confusing because patients with peptic ulcer disease often bleed, and by the time um, the blood has interacted with the acid and becomes black, you get melanin at the end. So it can often confuse the, can be confused. You don't know if it's just the Pepto-Bismol that's working or the um, or it's melanin and he's got a ruptured ulcer. Let's talk about mesoprostol. It's not really used in the setting of GERD anymore. Um, it is a prostaglandin receptor. Uh, it's an agonist. So what you're going to do is you're going to activate this prostaglandin receptor, which is going to um, which is coupled with a GI uh, protein, and uh, that's going to cause a decrease in cyclic AMP, which actually causes a decrease in activation of the hydrogen, um, the hydrogen potassium pump. So you get less acid. So 
Something else that it kind of does on the side is prostaglandin can actually increase mucus production. So it actually helps you coat the lining so you can help with peptic ulcer disease. Now this is um, some, something you need to know is that this is really only used in some occasions with, um, with NSAID associated peptic ulcer disease. Remember that NSAIDs actually decrease your mucus and because they decrease the mucus um, this acid is going to cause a lot of damage. Now, mesoprostol can actually increase the mucus and it can decrease the acid as well, giving you time to heal your ulcers. Now, the main reason that we use mesoprostol in a clinical setting is going to be for induction of labor or abortion. Sometimes a, a woman will have miscarriage or she'll um, choose to have an elective abortion and will provide mesoprostol as a, um, as a way to help with um, getting the products of her labor out of her uterus. This is rarely used um, since proton pump inhibitors are much more tolerable. Now remember the adverse effects can also be abor abortion. So don't you ever give this drug to a pregnant woman if she's planning on keeping her baby. She'll never forgive you. Alright, let's move on to octreotide. This is a somatostatin analog. As you can see, and somato means body and statin means inhibition. So this, of course, will inhibit your entire body pretty much. And that's how I like to think of somatostatin. It inhibits GI secretions, it inhibits GI activity, it inhibits the GI blood supply, and inhibits growth in the GI and growth in general. So let's talk a little bit about the uses. It can be used to um, reduce varicel bleeding. Here I've showed you some variceles, some esophageal varices, and they're getting bands right there to prevent them from bleeding. If you want to go become a GI doc, this is actually a pretty, uh, pretty cool procedure to do. And it, um, it's often in a very urgent setting since these patients are bleeding to death. It can also be used for acromegaly. Remember that um, acromegaly um, is a growth factor hormone, and this growth factor will actually go to your um, liver. So you've got too much growth factor that's going to your liver, and your liver is producing IGF-1. If you have octreotide, you can pretty much pr stop the production of IGF-1, and you don't get the effects of uh, of acromegaly, which is just a large skin, large bones. You can see these large bone production. Acro, um, you'll get large hands and heart failure in the, in the end. It can also be used to reduce tumors, like carcinoid tumors. Remember that it'll prevent the growth of these tumors, but it'll actually also reduce the blood supply going to these tumors. Adverse effects is going to be um, cramps and constipation because you've got a decreased GI activity. You're going to get steatorrhea because you get decreased pancreatic uh, secretions. And you can get gallstones because your gallbladder is not moving as much and, and so stones start forming there. So how are you going to use all of this information? It can feel pretty overwhelming, uh, but I, I beg you, please learn the physiology well. Everything in GI is just pretty much tied to the basic physiology. A lot of the questions are actually going to be testing your knowledge uh, in, in physiology, um, whether even if they're pharma, pharmacology related. So they're going to ask you, they're going to ask you something like, what part of the parietal cells would PPIs affect? And they'll have a couple of arrows going here, an arrow over here, an arrow, I don't know, over here, and then an arrow over here. And you just got to know that PPIs are going to work on the hydrogen potassium pumps, which are, of course, they're going to be over here around the lumen, but they're also inside of these Golgi vesicles right there, um, waiting to be moved up, up there. Also, because these drugs are so often used, some of the most common drugs used, the adverse effects are extremely important for this module. All right, thank you and good luck.